Well, welcome back to Barley and Hops. I'm George. Yes, the channel that dares to unlock the mysteries of homeless still, and we say it all the time. Yes. Ah, we welcome you back, and we appreciate your subscription. So, if you want to continue watching these, please just subscribe below. Um, share us with your friends. That we enjoy it, and we are here for the long haul. Now, whew, want to make sure that we get some things cleared up. Yeah. What about that? Either soaking grains or cooking grains. Uh. Oh wow. What about alcohol by volume in our fermenters? What's that all about? What about proof? In percentage coming out of our still. Hmm. Can, can we really simplify all of that? Well, I think we can. Oh, you may wonder why I'm standing out here in front of a frying pan. Make some scrambled eggs. Trust me, there is a point to all of this. Now, as we get going, uh, I figured it'll be a whole lot easier to show you something as opposed to just trying to describe it because uh, for some reason, it's so misunderstood. Um, you know, I get calls all the time, and I'm just going to mix these up. You know how to make scrambled eggs. Um, I get calls all the time about, you know, when we're preparing our grains. Um, George, how do we do that? And I'll explain it to them. I said, well, you heat it up because you have to convert the starches. Or well, at least you have to release all the starches before you can even convert them. Um, you throw a bunch of corn in with water and just let it sit there, and that's all it does is sit there. Uh, so, I, you know, the question that always arises, well, George, can't can I just soak it for a couple of days? It, I hear it all the time. I'm, well, certainly you can, but what's the outcome? Well, you know, now I've got this frying pan on my new Wave cooktop, and I'm not going to go through the description of this in any great detail. I'm just going to turn it on. Hey, listen to this. When you pick it up, it automatically turns off. So it's magnetic. It's an induction cooktop. So I've got my scrambled eggs because I'm getting ready to have breakfast, and I figure what better way to describe this than to actually show you. Now, I tried this. Uh, I tried to use the same rationale. For a couple of days, I left some scrambled eggs sitting outside hoping that they would turn into cooked scrambled eggs. Well, I don't want to show you the results of that. So, what I'm going to do here is describe to you what actually happens. Now, if you're following along, I think you can understand where we're going with this. If I take my scrambled eggs and I pour them in here, oh, just as I like them, just nice and lightly scrambled, this is what we're doing with grain. We put grain and water on a stove or on a heat source and we heat it up, we're molecularly we're changing that grain. Uh, we're releasing those starches, we're hydrolyzing. Okay? And in this particular case, you know that something is taking place on a physical molecular, I don't care what kind of level you call it. But something is changing. Something's taking place when you put these in a frying pan. That was rather quick. Because you end up with scrambled eggs. Now, let me ask you a question. How did I get from the only way to get from this to this? Heat. Heat and a frying pan. Yes, could have used a microwave, but we're not talking about a microwave. All right, but you, you notice that in order to make that change, I had to use heat. Uh, the same thing works for grain. So if you're trying to rationalize and say, well, why don't I just leave my grain set for a couple of days and soak? Will that do the same thing? Well, the answer is no. Just like leaving a couple of eggs sitting outside for a couple of days. I don't care how long you leave them set there. They're not going to turn into scrambled eggs unless you cook them. The next topic I think that we need a little, just a little bit more explanation on to simplify things is ABV. And we've all used that term, alcohol by volume. Now, it means something different through different parts of your process. Really, there's only two. 
okay? One of them is the fermentation, and then the other one is the distillation. Okay, and, and remember, there's a, there's a brick wall in between the two, okay? They do not mix. I'll get to that. Alcohol by volume in the mash or the wash. All right, and again, we use the term wash and mash. They're synonymous. They kind of mean the same thing to almost everybody, but if you're trying to be precise, uh, a mash is normally reserved for uh, a fermented product where you use grains and cereals and things like that because mash in that case is a noun and a verb. Mash is the result and also mashing is the process, you know, using heat, you know, to hydrolyze and to unlock all those starches that you convert to fermentable sugar. You follow me, okay? So it can be a noun or a verb, it doesn't matter. Okay, and wash is normally reserved for um, it, the, the, the terminology used to describe sugar, water, and yeast. Uh, but they're both the same thing in the very end, so you can use the term, they're interchangeable. It's totally up to you, okay? Um, I've got a five gallon mash, so that automatically tells you if someone uses the terminology precisely it automatically tells you that I used grain in order to make this now incidentally this was made uh, three and a half months ago yes it's just been sitting waiting I've got it sealed up that, that's again a demonstration of no no mash or wash does not go bad does not turn to vinegar okay as a lot of people think uh, you've got to actually tr force it. You, you've got to do something additional, and we're not even going to talk about that, but you've got to purposely convert this just like you converted the starch to fermentable sugars. Now you have to do something else to convert the alcohol to vinegar. Go figure. Okay, so, uh, and I've got, uh, I've got this marked out, uh, and I actually used a simple tape measure because we're going to use simple math. Um, and I've got it broken down to one, two, three, four, five gallons. Okay, so I've got five gallons of mash, and I happen to know in this particular mash, it is a 10% alcohol by volume. So what does that mean to me? That means that at 10%, I love this, I, I even got a, see, I got a whiteboard here. That's a 10% alcohol by volume. That means that 10% of this liquid is ethanol. Now, we know that ethanol and water do mix, okay? They're soluble, uh, actually miscible. Um, so it, it mixes throughout. So throughout this whole thing, 10% of that, that puppy is ethanol and the rest of it is water. Now, yes, there are some other byproducts inside, but they're so, they're so minuscule, we don't consider those at this point. <laughs> so what does 10% alcohol by volume mean to me? It means that of this five gallons, 10% of that is a half a gallon. 20% would be a full gallon. Now, would we agree that in here there are five of these? It just goes to show you. Uh, so, I do know right now that in this mash, whoop, yeah, that line's probably a little, there it is. If by chance that this was separated and I had ethanol on top and water on the bottom, I've got that much ethanol, pure ethanol in this container. All right? That's what that 10% alcohol by volume means. We know that's not true, that it's right here. We know that it's right here. All we gotta do is separate it. But if we were to think about this logically, we'd go, well, that means that much of it is pure ethanol. If we were able to extract it pure, at 100%, we would have that much. That much. This draws a line around here. There is that much ethanol in that container. That's what your alcohol by volume tells you. So it gives you a point, a data point of anticipation. Mm, anticipation? Do you, you, you see where I'm going with that? Um, so you start running your still and you've collected a pint. You go, well, I know there's a half a gallon in there. 
and then you collect a quart. Well, how many quarts are in a half a gallon? There's two. So I, I collected one of them. So I know there's one more left in there. So I just keep running. When I get close to that second quart, uh, if I were collecting at 100%, and we know we're not, and we're going to get to that. But once I get close to that second one, I go, okay, I'm just, I'm, it's about time to end this. You see where I'm going with that. It's, it gives you a data point um, and an understanding of what your anticipated draw should be, your collection. Let's, if, for, just for the sake of argument, let's say, for instance, and we already know that it's not a good idea, but let's say we use way, way too much sugar, and we played with it and messed with it. It took us forever and ever and ever, and we finally got to 20%. And instead of a 10% ABV, this was 20% ABV. Well, how much ethanol would be in here? Somebody wake up the guy in the back. Yeah, it's easy. Yeah, at that point, you would have one full gallon, which means we could fill this with ethanol. That's if you had 20%. Okay, because 20% of this would be one gallon. Okay, that's it 100%. Now, let's take this just one more logical step forward. We will revert back to 10% alcohol by volume. We haven't even got to the still. Now, this is only out here as an, as, as an example, okay? You cannot put that in here. It will not, well, you could, but you'll have some left over because, of course, this is a three-gallon still. That's a five gallon mash. I would need an eight gallon still, and that's why they come in those sizes. An eight gallon, you would never put eight gallons in it. It really holds a good six. You need some headroom in order to develop a vapor. Uh, okay, aside from that, this three gallon Mighty Mini, you could put three gallons in it because there is plenty of head space in here in order for it to develop its vapor. Okay, now, set this aside, okay? We didn't even get here yet. We're still working with this. So now we know what our anticipated draw should be. Okay, now for sake of argument again, and we're just trying to simplify this so that we know what to collect or how much we should collect. Okay, um, we know now that if you look back on some of the other videos, you know that there's two types of stills normally. Okay, one of them is a reflux still and the other one's a pot still. Okay, and we're going to use one of those two because I don't like to confuse them. Um, we know that in a reflux still uh, that you're having multiple distillations take place at one time, uh, a good average is about 180 proof. And what is 180 proof? It's 90% alcohol. Yeah, you see how that works? Percent is half of the proof. Okay, uh, now if we were using a pot still, um, in a pot still, a good average, not a definite, but a good average is about 140 proof, give or take, okay? Uh, and that, of course, is not all throughout the run. That's at the very beginning, and then it precipitously starts to drop. Okay, um, so we start off with 140 proof, which is 70% alcohol, and, of course, 30% water. Now, during the run, during your collection, you're not collecting pure ethanol. What are you collecting at 140 proof? You're collecting at 140 proof, you are collecting together, you're collecting, yeah, 70% ethanol and 30% water. So that's the mixture itself. So in the final tally, if I had a half of gallon in here, okay, and I know that I'm going to be collecting 30% water as long along with that ethanol, then I know that I can be I can be anticipatory. Huh, that's a long word. I can expect that my final draw. From this still, if I run the five gallons, would be probably about three quarters of a gallon, somewhere in that area. 
And why is that? That's because 70% of it is going to be ethanol, and in this percent of it's going to be water, H2O. So together, the mix, of, I'll have about three. So that's why I usually tell people, or I, I, usually, I, I usually offer, um, and I have to be cautious, I usually offer that in a five-gallon still with a 10% mash, you collect somewhere around three quarts. Somewhere around three quarters of a gallon. And if you do, that is considered good. All right? If you collect a little bit less than three quarters, you know, big deal. Who cares? It's yours. Um, if you collect way, way more than that, what are you collecting at that point? You're collecting tails. Um, or you're down to a low enough proof to where you're collecting more water than you are alcohol or ethanol. Does that make sense? So there I am, sitting in front of the still, doing what all distillers do, because you know we can't help it. We gotta watch it. Now we watch it for a couple different reasons. One, it's mesmerizing, and two, it's safe. Uh, so I know this in my head about my alcohol by volume and my mash, uh, and I know that my anticipation is about three quarts. And I'm running it, and I'm tracking the proof through a high, with a with a proof and trail hydrometer, not a normal one. Uh, and I collect the first quart, and I go, boop, got some more left in there. I collect the second quart, boop, I know I got some more left in there. Well, I get about halfway through that third quart, and I go, mm, guess what? Now it's time for me to start paying attention, a little bit more anyway, uh, to ensure that I'm not drawing out tails. And oh, by the way, I'll notice that my proof, if I'm using a parrot, or if I'm testing it throughout the process, I'll notice that my proof is precipitously dropping from 140 to 135, to 130, to 125, uh, until it gets down to a level that I'm comfortable with. And in my own experience, I'm comfortable with 100 proof, 50% alcohol. 50% alcohol is 50% alcohol and 50% water in the collection jar. Are we there yet? Uh, I do all collection in one container as much as possible. Um, only because I know that I'm going to mix them all together anyway. Now, there are people who do them in separate stages, and there's a reason for that. And, and that's quite all right as well. Remember, that is a technique. And your technique is always going to be right. Please, just don't violate the principles. Now that we understand the math, the simple math of percentages, we really have an idea on how long do you think we should be sitting in front of that still. Well, we should be sitting there until we get to our expectation. And our expectation is based on understanding and science. Well, we do appreciate your attention. Yes. And thanks for coming back. Share us with your friends, please. And now that I think we've cleared up quite a few things, for most of you, I know this is a review. But for those who are scratching your head, yep, you look back through our videos. We've got hundreds of videos uh, that cover just about any and every topic in the distilling practice that you could potentially look for. So, thanks again for viewing, and as always, happy distilling.